Again, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the discussions, which I feel have been very valuable. But up to now, we have been more centered in planning and appraisal and more looking at uh, within cities and uh, how uh, different authorities are beginning to use different tools. Um, so now I want to turn uh, the focus to how accessibility indicators are able to help us to benchmark cities and uh, a large number of cities. And uh, yes, this is part of the uh, work that we are developing at the International Transport Forum. Uh, with uh, guidance from <laughs> Luis as well, because uh, we meet regularly to review the type of data that we're using, whether uh, this uh, work should lead up to going beyond Europe and these types of questions. Uh, but it is uh, certainly a very nice opportunity to have all of you here and to help us improve, upgrade, and make more solid our methodologies, but also to tell us what you feel would be more useful for this work to evolve into uh, for the near future. So uh, basically, when we look at work that has been developed to benchmark uh, across cities, we can kind of divide it as bottom-up and top-down approaches. So bottom-up is more like uh, the work that, for example, Conveyal and WRI uh, are working in. Uh, so you go case by case. Sometimes you uh, join with the local authorities, and you're able to get data. And then you try to apply a similar methodology going uh, to different cities. And of course, that gives you a good level of, of uh, detail in the type of indicators that you can develop. But when you're really talking about uh, building a global uh, benchmark, well, it might just take really long to really be able to adapt it to a large number of cities. So uh, there is this other top-down approach, which is uh, the one that uh, the ITF has been developing already with some work that we did uh, since 2016 for Transport Outlook, but that is also followed here in this um, uh, project and is really uh, going and taking the data sets that are available at global level and trying to, well, verify them, but uh, use them because it's what uh, makes more sense if you really want to compare a large number of cities. And, um, well, just one note, because we are, as I said, trying to think where this work might lead us to, is that, uh, of course, with now the SDGs and the new urban agenda, putting the focus on access and access for all, well, one of the main questions of uh, all of us that we have more or less been uh, in the process of the development of this new urban agenda is how are we going to track whether it's being implemented or not. And if the, there is a global goal on access, well, it is just very logical and very, uh, very direct need to have to measure where we're going over time in meeting this uh, global goal. Um, so uh, just to, to mention one of the main features of our work, I wanted to, to um, put this uh, graph out uh, this is uh, from previous work that we've done. And here you see uh, the categories of cities by different sizes. But in uh, the left side, you see how they would rank if we were to measure the uh, percentage of population that, are, uh, that have uh, accessible uh, transport stops at a certain threshold, right? Like at walking distance. And what you see is that if you uh, rank the same cities, but according to the percentage of population that you would actually access, like from uh, other points of the city, well, these cities don't rank in the same way. And uh, that is uh, the, I mean, that is why we didn't want to, to focus 
on a framework that uh, is constrained only to measuring accessibility to public uh, transport services, but going beyond to origin destination accessibility. And uh, the framework that we have been working on in the ITF, uh, firstly focused in the access from the, of people to people, but now one of the underlying features of this new benchmarking that we're doing as part of this project is to actually uh, measure accessibility to services. And in reality, we wanted to do it to points of interest in general, but uh, one of the fa first data constraints that we faced was that in Europe, it is not very uh, easy to get other data, for example, uh, jobs. So these data constraints uh, led us to try to focus at least for, for, for this uh, uh, first project in accessibility to services. Now, um, while we were developing the work, we thought, well, of course, it's very interesting to have a database uh, that uh, different users and stakeholders uh, can take and then do their own computations and try to answer their questions. But then we thought, can we go one step further on that? And can we propose a visualization tool that facilitates these uh, stakeholders that are going to be using this data for visualizing different results and visualizing the answers to some of the questions in, um, in a way that is more user friendly. And also uh, very inspired on the experience that other colleagues at the OECD has, uh, have already had with uh, some of the well-being uh, indicators that they have. Well, uh, we thought that maybe uh, in, uh, in the future, this could also give us some information about what people want to know. So by using the information that comes from the users, we could see whether, for example, uh, um, they tend to put some weights that we could leave flexible to some services or uh, the comparisons between specific modes. And we could also use it as a source of information for these kinds of questions. So, um, and finally, what we also thought, and that I think is very linked to what we were saying yesterday, is once you can benchmark accessibility, can you also know whether it, for example, for some people to have less accessibility than others, is that being a problem? Is that leading into uh, poverty or social exclusion or uh, some sustainability problems or so, some uh, barriers to meeting some, some sustainability goals? So, of course, what we know is that this uh, database and these very simple accessibility indicators could be used to go further down into policy questions. Of course, it is difficult because you need many times to cross it with other data, to have more sophisticated tools, maybe a set of maps for, for some of these analyses. So we cannot do it for the wide range of cities that the database will be available for, but we can definitely do it for some um, subset of cities and we and in that way we can also uh, look at the potential of the indicators for doing more detailed analysis. So basically from these discussions we want to have some feedback from all of you in these different components of the work and uh, kind of test firstly the different ideas that we have because this I mean, in principle, it's also uh, ending in a ranking of cities. So we want to know whether some indicators are make sense to rank cities according to these indicators. Maybe you have new ideas of other indicators. Maybe you totally disagree with some of the indicators that we show in the paper, and that is also part of what we want to know. And um, also, we have there in the paper uh, shown some of the ways in which we're thinking this visualization tool could be flexible for the user and also the types of graphs and the type of kind of visual aid that we are proposing. We want to know what your feeling is about that <coughs> and whether you have other ideas again. 
and finally get your impressions on how is how how do you see the potential for using these uh, first uh, more basic indicators for linking it to two main uh, policy questions those that have to do with inclusiveness and those ha that have to do with sustainability so uh, that is it from me the only thing I'm going to say now is that at the end of the presentation, I would, if uh, Louis also wants to add something on some objectives that he feels might uh, need to be still highlighted so that all of you can focus your comments, uh, uh, we are open for that. And other than that, I am going to now leave you with my colleagues from the modeling team. You have... And, yeah. So um, I think this morning we all understood that transport policies should promote accessibility rather than mobility. I mean, I guess if you listen to the, remotely the workshop, I'm sure you did. Uh, and clearly an evidence of that is um, that accessibility made it to the sustainable development goals. But as any goal, I think achieving it required to be able to measure it and monitor it. So at first, which is what is probably at least the source of our willingness to work on accessibility at ITF was that we looked at what was available at a large scale on urban accessibility measure and metrics. And we find that actually what was available was mainly what could be called as infrastructure-based accessibility measure. So typically congestion measures, uh, percentage of people living near bus stops, those kind of index. And to be honest, we were, I mean, I've, I feel those index are interesting, but they are still a bit disappointing regarding measuring accessibility because we could argue it's not really measuring accessibility. So our aim was really to go one step further, just one small step further really, uh, to actually design metrics that really focus on access to opportunities and not just on the transport system characteristics. That's how we came up with this wish list. Um, so first thing, yeah, we need, want to focus on access to opportunities. We want metrics that are simple because we want to scale them up, apply them to many, many cities. Of course, if we want to compare, I mean, this is kind of obvious to say, we want them to be comparable. Okay, I know it seems obvious, but it's actually very, it's a big challenge, very difficult to achieve. And finally, we want them to be multimodal. I guess you would all throw stones at me if they were not, but by multimodal, I just mean we want them to cover not only road, but other modes of transport. So, next slide. Uh, that's the solution we propose to answer this wish list. So, I mean, it's kind of straightforward. First, we want something simple. So we use counter-based metrics. Um, well, there's many reasons for that. We've said during the day that uh, it was much more simple to understand. It's also much more simple to compute. Um, I guess the only thing you could have argue on this point would do, would you use um, a DKE function or not? Uh, and we believe that we shouldn't. I mean, you can always. Um, this is a debate, really, uh, because it makes things less in common units. And also, you could argue that depending on the city, the DKE function should not be the same, and would add which would add up another element of variability between cities. So we felt. Like counter based matrix were actually well fitted to our objective. Then uh, we decided to have quite large coverage. As part of our project with European Union, we said we are going to cover systematically, well, as far as we can, uh, cities over half a million inhabitants. Uh, for all those cities, we want to be doing at least three modes of transport car, walking, and cycling. And for many of them, we want to be able to do public transport. We decided to focus on nine services. I'm going to describe them later. And we compute those contour-based <laughs> metrics for free time threshold, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and one hour. So as you see, we tried to offer to have a data to come up with a database that's very rich, so you can use it to answer many different questions, not a single one, many different. Uh, to be comparable, we need global database and global formats. And I think clearly we couldn't have made this work a few years ago because uh, the data landscape has changed a lot. Typically, I mean, I take OpenStreetMap as an example on this slide, but another very good example would be GTFS. Uh, without standardized data format, we could not have achieved what we achieved. So we 
I mean, I really believe in standard and I, I mean, standard in data, not totally, but in standard in data. And this was very important for us. So we used only data which were in global standards. Typically right now, we are going to do that, but London is not included because London doesn't provide GTFS. I, I know you, it's not your fault, but, <laughs> but yeah, I'm just pointing, I, I just pointing that. Uh, and finally, comparable approach. We have the same data, so I mean, it's awesome. We can do exactly the same computation. Uh, with comparable parameters, obviously a city definition vary from country to country when it's administrative. That's why we use a function urban area uh, defined by uh, OECD and um, European Commission. And we try to have no behavioral parameters. I already talk, uh, talk about the decay function, which to me is a kind of a behavioral parameters. We don't use value of time because we just work with travel time, but uh, uh, typically, we wouldn't have used, uh, we, we decided not to work with general cost because of that, because otherwise we would have to work with value of time and we think it would have created some difference between city and losing comparability. Uh, well, very quickly, uh, what services we included, most of them, they come from TomTom, Tom, so that we have at the European level. Uh, to rather fine uh, geographical scale. And we came up with these nine services with some groupings at some time, I mean, are a bit arbitrary to be honest, but you need to simplify a bit the reality when you want to do uh, benchmarking at this level. Um, okay, and uh, well, I don't, don't think there's many, much to say really. Um, so remember, uh, I want to work with, I want to compare city. So actually, I want aggregated metrics by city. And the metrics I originally <coughs> described to you is actually more uh, local metrics. So this is one step I've not, dis I've not uh, talked about, which is the aggregation. So basically, what we've done is for each city, we've produced the data to produce those kind of maps. So it means typically for, for Paris, we've computed such maps for car public transport, We've not done walking and cycling yet, to be honest, but at the end we will do for the nine services and the three thresholds. So at the end, you end up with nearly 100 map like this, and obviously we cannot work with that. So we've done an aggregation using simply uh, a weighted value. So all these cells have a population, and we weight those accessibility matrix by population to come up with a single value. I'm just showing you this slide to actually illustrate to you that I'm going now just to uh, talk about the aggregated value. But behind those aggregated value, you need to realize that there's all this data, all these maps. So it's actually, I mean, of course, we talk about a, at a very general level, but remember, behind you have actually very geographical data. Uh, okay, so obviously uh, we made a few, well, just to be perfectly clear with you, one slide on how we compute travel times. I think you know, sometimes in details, I mean, details matter, and sometimes it's good to know exactly what's behind. So to have travel times, we actually took uh, speed of observations that were provided to us by INRIX, so which means for every city, uh, we had really quite a lot of speed observation. I think Paris is probably 2,000 speed, observa speed observation. By speed observation, I mean, an average speed over one year on one road link. So it's really a lot of data. And those speed observation, we had them for hour by hour over all the day. So we could detect peak hours, for example. We only take for road, we only, I mean, for road plus public transport, actually, we focused only on peak hours. That was a choice. And it's very difficult to take in account and to assess accurately access and parking time in road, so we just assume it's 10 minutes. Maybe not the best assumption, but I'm being very transparent here. Uh, for public transport, we, do, we did door-to-door -door computation, which means we take into account access, waiting, and transfer time. And schedules, other schedules you would get from GTFS, which means they are theoretical. Uh, we didn't take real-time uh, uh, public transport. Well, first, because they are not available in that many cities. And when they are, it would have required just too much work for us. Uh, at the end, I mean, I have to admit, uh, I don't know if there are data scientists genius in uh, around the table, but we found it was rather big data analysis, probably not what formally we would call big data, but 
quite a lot. So just to give you a grasp, a few numbers, I mean, it's not to say the more complicated the better, but just so you realize that behind this, there was something which was quite huge. Uh, we have around 115 functional urban area over half a million inhabitants in Europe. This is, oh, that's something I did not mention. Um, we did our computation on a one kilometer by one kilometer grid. And for people who are familiar with that, it's not a very fine scale, but obviously once you want to apply your methodology to many cities, that's something you have to choose. So at the end, we had one million grids over all those cities, 100 million ODP to compute, and another example, our road network was 20 million road links. It's quite, it's basically very big data. And this, I think it, it actually allow us to have more accurate measure, but it definitely come with lots of challenge. Typically, I mean, data quality is a huge, huge, huge issue but because you're trying to compare city you've never been to, uh, a scale which are very different, with data which is not commercially, I mean, not always commercially provided. Typically, OpenStreetMap is not commercially provided. And clearly, the common sense to say quality is good is, is clearly not enough. So we try to perform as much as uh, quality check as we could, but we are still it's a still an uh, ongoing process. We still have a lot of quality suspicion. And also, I mean, we produce a lot of results, so analyzing them is not very straightforward. Um, so maybe you wonder, you know, like this guy just told me about producing a lot of data, but can we really use it for something? So there's two, we, we believe there's at least two ways you could use this data, or we could use this, this data. Uh, typically, we think comparing city, uh, I don't know if it's benchmarking or comparing, but clearly comparing city is an interesting thing. Uh, I'm going to describe you our first results. It's only on nine city to illustrate because we have been wise enough to first compute on a small sample and to look at the result on a small sample to uh, be sure that when we go on the large sample, everything goes well. And yeah, it's still a bit temporary results, by the way. So two different perspectives, and I think it relates quite well to the discussion we already had in this workshop. Uh, the first one, we looked at how many services can you access in absolute value or in percentage of the total service offered by the city uh, for 30 minutes. I'm going to show you this results. But we also thought it was interesting to reverse the reasoning and to say, okay, let's take this, I don't know if it's a paternalist approach or not, but this kind of approach to say, um, assume you have a minimum of baskets, uh, basket services, uh, you want people to be able to reach some uh, services by a certain amount of time. How many people in your city do you have that check this criterion? Uh, so this is a kind of way to use this data. We believe it could be used in many different ways. Uh, well, I'm going to give you an illustration. I've tried to ask myself, um, is there a correlation between income and accessibility? in cities of France, and how does this vary between cities? I think it's an interesting question. And I think it actually shows that all this pre-work we've been doing by producing this database makes, allow you to answer many, many interesting questions in a very fast way, and I think it's very interesting. By the way, uh, that's what we are doing, but we aim to make this database open source because we have tried to guarantee that not, nothing we use forbids us to do, <laughs> to make this database open source. And as Aimé was mentioning, in addition to make the database open source, because it probably interests only a couple of us that are able to deal with very, very large data, we want to make a small visualization tool. Uh, I mean, I guess we were not inspired by the PTAL, but it's, it's exactly the same thing. You have lots of data, and so we'd like also the general public to be able to play a bit with this data even if they cannot do go into deeper analysis uh, that you could do with the database. Um, so results, so it's a very complex graph, so I'm going to be quite slow to explain it because it shows a lot of data. Uh, each city is described by what you could call the flower graph and each petal of the flower represents the access to one type of services. So you have all the nine services that I've described you previously. But obviously, the access to each services, well, the order of magnitude for each of those values varies a lot. So we, you have a different scale for each of the petals. So you need to be very careful of that. Obviously, there are not that many universities in the city, but you have lots of shops. 
So I couldn't have plotted that with the same scale. That, that's a bit of the trick. Now let's go a bit to the results. I think you should be surprised by the huge variation between CT, I was. Um, you need to understand that it's mainly, um, <laughs> well, there's two reasons that explain the variation. In, I mean, in some city you have more services than other, I and mean, to be more accurate, the density of services vary a lot between city and city. And there's also a bit of average speed effect. In some city you travel much more. So you can look at this trade off uh, by looking at a specific example. Typically, access to school in Paris and Madrid. School is this green khaki. Uh, so it's the first green you can see clockwise. Yeah, I know the colors are a bit difficult to, <laughs> to read. We, we will improve the graph. Um, but if you compare that between Paris and Madrid, you can see that access to school in Paris and Madrid is more or less the same. It actually results from a very different reason. In Paris, the density of school per square kilometer is very high. In our sample, it's more or less twice higher than most of the city. But driving in Paris is very slow. Uh, it's also in our sample probably one of the most congested city. Believe me, it's kind of true. Um, Madrid is just the other one. The density of school is just average, really. But with our data and regarding to this specific question, actually, speed to school is kind of okay. So you end up having the same accessibility, but for two different reasons. One city is good in land use, let's say, and one city performs well in speed. But overall, I have to say, most of the difference you see on those graphs are more density related than speed related, because the speed between city doesn't vary that much. Uh, I'm going to public transport. So what you should, something a bit difficult to notice, but very important, the scale changed a lot. I didn't put you the public transport in the same scale as road, because otherwise you would have seen nothing. Why is that? 30 minutes by public transport in most of the city when you do door-to-door -door computation is actually not that much, because usually you need to walk to the public transport stop and to wait a bit. And so probably with a 30 minute threshold, you are not exactly on, on the optimal level of uh, efficiency of the public transport. When you do your reasoning at a city-wide level, remember functional urban area is city core plus commuting zone. So it's really, really big. Obviously, if I would have produced the same result just for the city core, probably the picture would have been slightly different. But still, I mean, 30 minutes by public transport give you a bit of penalty compared to, to car. It's a bit too short. You, very different result when you do three quarter of an hour or one hour thresholds. Uh, another interesting thing, I think, is actually the ranking of, well, it's not really a ranking, but the, our city campus is very different. Before, you had the huge dominance of Paris. Paris was a lot better in everywhere. Now you can see that many cities have strengths and weakness, and it really depends on which uh, services you are looking at. Uh, I mean, you have something which I think very surprising, but when I analyze them, are okay. Uh, Bilbao, huge access to restaurants. I've never been to Bilbao, so I don't know if it's true. Paris, quite a poor access to restaurants, actually, compared to Bilbao. Not very surprising to me. I mean, in Paris, all the restaurants are with, right within the center, and there are many places within the close suburbs which have a poor access to the Paris center because the public transport system in Paris is very, very centered. So it actually does make sense to me. Um, well, this is another perspective, probably a bit less, I mean, a bit saying the same thing in a different way. We've been computed accessibility in absolute number, the number of shops. You could also look at what can you reach in 30 minutes in percentage. So typically, uh, well, in Paris, I don't know the number by art, but yeah, in Paris, more or less, you can reach seven, uh, sorry, in Bilbao, more or less, in half an hour, you can reach more than 60% of shop, university, hospital, everything, actually. Well, in Paris, obviously, it's a very, very big city, so uh, in half an hour, you just reach a small proportion of what's actually available in the city. So it's a different view. It tends to make the density effect a bit more, a bit less important. It can, it tend to actually uh, correct the fact that bigger cities in the previous indicator tend to look better. Uh, well, I mean, it's really, it answers a slightly different question, really. Uh, well, so let's go to the 
opposite way of thinking things? Um, do you have access to a minimum of services? So in this simple example, we took walking distance. So obviously, for some, it doesn't make any sense to compute walking distance for some of the services. Typically, I mean, I think you don't need an hospital within walking distance. So you can see that in this graph, it's mainly the services that make sense within a walking distance that appears. But you have actually very striking results if you look at the detail. So I have an example. Access to education in Paris. You have 60% Paris urban area, we agree. You have 60% of the place in Paris urban area when you can actually walk to at least three school. You have the number of the minimum number which we choose. By the way, they are a bit arbitrary because I agree it's a bit paternalistic. Uh, but what we want to offer to people we use that uses our database is to choose because all the data will be available to choose which level minimum level they want. So, because I'm pretty sure that this varies between expectation of each city because each inhabitant probably has its own expectation. So. Education in Paris, 60% of the people can walk to a school, and it's only around 35% in Berlin. I, I think it's quite surprising. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly the very subtle reason of that, but from my first guess looking at the data, um, uh, well, first, the distribution of school in Paris is much more uniform than it is in Berlin, but also in the commuting zone of Berlin, you have very, very rural area where you can act not just access to school. Still, I think the result is quite surprising. Uh, very last results. I'm sorry, there's lots of data that I'm showing to you. Was my question, income and accessibility, is there a relationship? So in this graph, what you can see, I've took more or less the nine biggest cities in France. I've divided the population uh, depending on their income, lower third, middle third, upper third. And I've computed the average accessibility within each city that you would have if you belong to one of these categories. Beware the scale is not the same by city because obviously uh, each city has a very different access profile. But what you can see, what I was interested in it is as a shape for it, of this city of the graph. And what you can see is in Paris, clearly if you are in the upper third, you have a lot better accessibility by public transport. Two shops, so it's only two shops. Uh, than if you are in the lower third and middle third. And this is not true. Well, basically everywhere in, in France except Paris. So I think it's actually quite interesting. I would have guessed that the public transport system was a bit unfair in, uh, in Paris, but I would never have guessed that it was at, up to this point compared to all the French city. You might say that, well, I'm comparing Paris to smaller cities, it's a bit unfair, it's not really a good comparable set. So you might want to compare that to London or Berlin. Well, you know, that's exactly why we are working on that, because very soon you will be able to do that. Uh, so that was more or less all I wanted to show. I'm going back to this slide, because it's, a, it's supposed to uh, uh, start the discussion. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I've not talked much about this visual t visualization tool Amy was mentioning, but basically, uh, what we meant by that is we want to actually showcase this data in a nice and dynamic way, and I'm sure all of you have ideas about that. This flower thing was our first ideas, but we are really willing to hear your view on that. Thank you very much.